I'm kind of sad today because I like Memorial Weekend, but the choir will be gone for the summer, so I want to thank you for all you've done for us all year. And of course, for Christopher leading them, and for Jim and Pat, and for it's just been wonderful. I look forward to summer, but I don't like the choir not being here, so. So there was an old fable that tells about an elderly man. He was traveling with a donkey and with a boy, and they were walking through villages, and as they walked along through the first village, the old man was leading the donkey and the um, boy was following behind. And the people were complaining. They said, you're a fool for walking alongside the donkey. You should be riding on the donkey. So he got on the donkey and rode on the donkey and the little boy walked behind. And when they came to the next village, they thought, that's horrible. He's making the boy walk and the man's riding on the donkey. So he got off the donkey and they got the little boy on the donkey and they went walking to the next village. Well, then they got to the next village and they were complaining, why aren't you both riding on the donkey? So the old man gets on the donkey with the little boy and then they go to the fourth village. And they said, oh, that poor donkey, why are you both riding on the donkey? And then finally you see the old man walking away, carrying the donkey on his shoulders. <laughs> You know, to be popular, you have to please everyone. And we know that you cannot please everyone all the time. But the one that we should be pleasing all the time is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, as God's children, as, um, as Christians, it's very, our, our relationship with Jesus is so important. And I think I would go so far as to say that Having a relationship with Jesus is probably the most important relationship that we could ever have. Would you agree with that? Jesus is so perfect. You know, we let one another down, but if we go to Jesus, Jesus is not going to let us down. Jesus will always be there for us. And it doesn't matter where we are in life, what path we are in life, the most important relationship is with Jesus and that we have Jesus with us on that path. And you know, some of us have grown up in the church and have become part of the church, you know, this wonderful family, and our faith has come about, you know, subtly. We, we didn't get that bonk on the head from Jesus saying, here I am, that some people get, right? And then there's some that are still here and have belonged to the church all their life and still don't get it or we still question, we, have, we question our faith once in a while. And then there's others in life who are just now realizing, wow, this is Jesus, I can have, an ex I can have a relationship with him, but I don't know how, about I should go, how I should go about that. But no matter what path we are on, each one of our paths is an individual experience. Each path, each life of ours, has its own struggles. Each one of us carries our own baggage from past experiences. We have hurts and heartaches, but we also have joy and happiness and so much more. So it's kind of hard for us to compare ourselves to one another because we don't have the same experiences. We didn't grow up the same way. So each one of us has a unique path that we are on. But no matter what we are, where we are on our path in life or what we are doing, we need to know that Jesus is walking with us every step of the way and never leaves us. And Jesus accepts us just as we are. And just like us, each one of Jesus' disciples, they were each unique in their own way with their personalities, their vocations, and their families, and their backgrounds. And they were each unique. And Jesus brought them together. But the amazing thing is, is that Jesus was in their midst. He was with them every step of the way. And the difference between them and, and us is that we don't see Jesus right there with us. But they got to experience Jesus. Jesus taught them and walked with them. And he gave them life experiences that they never would have had had they not followed him. And they grew in their faith. They, knew, they grew in their love for Jesus. 
and they grew in their love for one another. It's not to say that they didn't have their battles while they were together, but they were together. And that's what it means to have Jesus in our lives. So today we're going to talk about um, Simon and uh, Simon Peter and Jesus. But before we go into that, because I, th I think today's reading is, is a wonderful reading, and I love it because it shows the humanness of not only Simon Peter, but it shows the humanness of Jesus. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But I want, I want you to think about the relationships that you have in your own life. You know, we have our biological families, those people in our lives, whether for better or for worse, they're a part of us. And when, then we have, um, we have those relationships with extended family. We have friends and we have coworkers. We have people that we meet along the way for various reasons. But think about all the relationships in your life. And then I, I, I thank God for this wonderful family that brought us all here together because we're family as well. And I think that's so amazing. But throughout our lives, people come and go. And what happens when we first meet someone? We want to take the time. We want to get to know them. We want to know their hobbies. We want to take an interest in their work. We want to know their families, their friends, and all of that. We just want to take a better interest in them. We want to find out whether we really like them or not, right? Are they worth the time and commitment to form a relationship? When uh, my husband and I first met back in 1992, we wanted to get to know each other. We wanted to know about each other's families. We wanted to know their friends and everything we could, take interest in our hobbies that we had. And so we took the time to get to know one another. And when we met, this is when I worked in Mishawaka, so I would commute from Chester to Mishawaka every day. And he worked shift work, and he'd get off midnights, and he'd drive to Mishawaka just to have lunch with me. We won't talk about the many times he was stopped along the way or how many tickets he got. <laughs> if that doesn't say love, I don't know what does. So we've been together more than 31 years, and in June we're going to celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary. But I'm not, I'm not bragging about it because it, it hasn't all been perfect. You know, we've let each other down. We've taken one another for granted. And we've had our struggles through those years. But for the most part, there has been joy and happiness. And we've been through a lot together. But we always included Jesus in our union. And sometimes we look, in our, look back at our life together and I think we forgot most of the struggles that we've been through. But we look back at our life together and think, wow, how did we make it, you know? But the only answer I have for that is that our love for one another and in everything, we included Jesus in our union. And we know that Jesus was walking us through everything and Jesus continues to walk us through us through everything that we go through. And our faith in Jesus is what has carried us through. Not to mention that relationships take time. They take commitment. And so it is with our relationship with Jesus. When we first come to faith in Jesus, we want to know everything we can about Jesus. We want to build that relationship. You know, I love watching new Christians because they dig right in. They say, I want to join a Bible study. I want to get a Bible. I want to do this. I'm praying more. You know, they get all this energy and everything. And then something happens in their life. And it, quite, it makes, you know, or something happens in our life. And it makes us question our faith. We may question, is Jesus really there? Is Jesus really listening to me? Does Jesus really love me? And it's in those moments that we find ourselves at a fork in the road. Yeah, all week I kept thinking about what Pastor Kevin said last week when he did, did the um, gospel reading where Jesus sighed. And throughout the week when I, would have, when I would have a struggle or something would get to me and I'd pray about it, back in my mind I could hear Jesus sighing. When are you going to get it? When are you going to understand that I'm right here with you? So all week I just kept hearing Jesus sigh. And that's, and that's probably what he does today. When are you going to get it? Jesus performed miracle after miracle, and Jesus constantly walks with us. Jesus constantly blesses us, but we don't always see it. 
We don't always pay attention. And with Jesus in our lives, even when we make the wrong choices, when we turn to Jesus, we're forgiven. Who else does that for us? And I think that is why the writer of the Gospel of John included today's reading in the Gospel. Today's Gospel reading describes what happened shortly after the resurrection, and it gives us a picture of longing. It's Jesus face to face with Peter. On the last night before Jesus was crucified, Peter had denied not once, but three times that he even knew his friend who was in trouble. And now here we are. After Jesus has been crucified, died, and resurrected, we have this scene on the beach. And the disciples are eating breakfast. And who made the breakfast? Jesus made the breakfast. And they may be somewhat confused. You know, they know Jesus died, they, and then he's resurrected, and here he is very much alive and in their presence once again. And he hasn't explained this to, uh, to them. And this is actually the third time, after all of that, that he has appeared to the disciples. And I'm sure they were probably just glad to see him, to have him in their midst, and they were, they were able to relax in his presence. After all, they'd been together for three years. And now Jesus and Peter have this moment together. And if you look at the, if you really look at the gospel reading, Jesus wasn't calling him Peter. Peter stands for the rock. Remember that? Jesus called him the rock. Now he's calling him Simon. And it kind of reminds me when you're a kid, when you know you're in trouble and your parents use your whole full name. Well, he calls him Simon here, not Peter the Rock. So now they're having to address this elephant in the room. What, and what Peter has to be most conscious of, conscious of is his embarrassment and his shame. And here it comes, time to face the music. You know those moments when you know your failure or whatever you've done wrong is right there in front of you, and it's time to address that, that feeling? And the last time that they were together, before the crucifixion, Jesus had, be, had predicted that Peter would betray him. And Peter pro protested, I would never do that. But then J Jesus responded and said, yes, you will. Not once, but three times. Peter had been sure that Jesus was wrong. He knew their relationship. He had left everything and followed him. He had left, left his family, his way of life. And they had been together for three years through thick and thin. Peter knew himself. He loved Jesus. There is no way he would betray Jesus. How can he even say such a thing? And then it happened, just the way Jesus had predicted. Can we blame Peter? What if we put ourselves in Peter's shoes? His life may have been on the line as well if he admitted that he knew Jesus. And imagine if we were in that very place at that very time where Peter was. Peter had been scared, and rightly so. So he pretended that he didn't know Jesus. He wanted to remain anonymous. He didn't just deny him one time. He denied him a second time and a third time. And just as Jesus had predicted, Peter denied three times that he knew him. And then the rooster crowed. And Peter had been living with this shame of that moment ever since that night. And now here he is face to face, just him and Jesus, this friend of his who he had let down, this friend of his who he had denied knowing. Like I said, Jesus already appeared to the disciples two times before this time on the beach. And nothing was ever said about Peter's denial of knowing Jesus during those first two encounters. And even right when they come back together, nothing's ever said. Peter didn't mention it. And he didn't even apologize. You know, Peter was probably hoping that Jesus didn't know about it, or he was hoping that Jesus forgot about it. And just like Peter, it's in these moments where our shame runs so deep that we cannot even speak of it. And so the conversation begins. Do you love me? Peter says, I do. Jesus asks again, Peter, do you love me? Of course I do, was his response. One more time, Jesus asks. 
And at this point, you can probably feel the frustration, see it on his face, that Peter is so frustrated and exasperated. And he said, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. And then Peter finally gets it. Three times, Jesus invited him to say yes. And this was to help undo the three times that, Jesus, that Peter had said no. Jesus had proven to Peter in this moment that he had forgiven his friend. And he did it in the only way that would allow Peter to forgive himself as well. And this conversation that took place on the beach, this is the heart of grace. It's a reminder to Peter, and it's also a reminder to us that we can love Jesus alongside our own failures and betrayals, because Jesus can love us alongside them as well. And this exchange between Peter and Jesus says something else as well. It says that our loving Jesus matters to Jesus. Jesus needed to hear it. He needed to hear that Peter loved him. And it also matters to us. Not because Jesus promises us some insurance against illness or tragedy. Not because faith will make us feel good every day regardless of what our circumstances are. But if we really get it, if we could internalize it deeply until it carves out a place that lives inside us, that knowing that we are seen and known and heard and loved unfailingly and unconditionally, that could change everything. It would change the way we judge and demand accomplishments from ourselves, and it can keep us from being constantly disappointed in other people, who people these people who don't see our true value like Jesus does. And it would change the way that we look at life and what's important in life. You know, we, we take so much value in our, in our things and our possessions. And that we think those things are going to fill that emptiness that's inside of us. That emptiness is in, there inside of us so that we fill it with the love of Jesus Christ, not with anything else. And Jesus wants a relationship with each one of us. And he wants us to include him in every aspect of our lives. He wants to walk alongside us on our individual paths because only Jesus truly knows what each of one of us has gone through or is going through. And Jesus wants us to know most of all that he loves us unconditionally, unconditionally. And no matter what we do, when we turn to Jesus, Jesus will forgive us. Jesus loves us. He is there for us. And this is what a relationship with Jesus looks like. Do you love me? After each time that Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He came with a response, with an action. And the first time that he asked him, the action was feed my lambs. And then the second time was tend my sheep. And the third time was feed my sheep. Peter the rock did just that for the rest of his days. He showed his love for Jesus and how he reached out and loved other people. And he did this for the rest of the days of his life and how he cared for others and how he taught others and how he lived his faith for all to see. And that's exactly what we are called to do. Writer Doris Donnelly tells the story of her great aunt's um, voyage to America Donnelly's grandmother hadn't seen her sister Greta for more than 25 years. She had lived in Holland. So she sent Greta some money so that she could immigrate, and Greta immediately booked passage on the first uh, steamer out of Rotterdam. And instead of waiting six months for better accommodation, she decided she would pick the first one, and she ended up in the storage area for the two weeks that she was on the ship. But there was a purser on the ship who regularly invited families who were traveling in the crowded and uncomfortable um, conditions in the lower deck. He invited them during the day to come up on the upper decks. And he invited Greta to do the same. But she said, no, I won't do that. I'll stay right here. So she stayed on her bunk the whole time she was making her voyage to America. For two whole weeks, she stayed there. And finally, when the ship docked in New York, Greta finally came out of steerage to the upper decks, and she is amazed at what she saw. 
There were comfortable, well-appointed areas where travelers could socialize, feast, and enjoy their leisure. And more surprising to Greta was all the passengers that she had been down in the lower deck with were up there enjoying their, their time up there. They were feasting together. They were socializing. They were having a great time. And she didn't realize that all of this could have been hers if she had only accepted the gift that the purser had offered. And we have that same choice to make with Jesus Christ. And it's not just a one-time thing. I accept Jesus and he's Lord of my life and it's done. We sometimes have to do that every day to accept to walk with Jesus, especially when times get tough. And we may have to do it several times a day. But Jesus works in our lives in amazing and wonderful ways through the workings of the Holy Spirit. And all we have to do is accept this gift. Listen to and heed these words from Colossians 2 once again, and this is the New Living Translation. It said, Now and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Like I said, it's a choice that we have to make over and over again to follow Jesus. Let your roots grow down deep into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Gratitude for all that Jesus does, and gratitude is so important. It can change our attitude no matter what we are going through if we have gratitude. And then it says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense, nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. So we, we don't follow the ways of this world. You know, it's like that the man and the donkey. We're not going to please everybody. But the one that we should be pleasing is Jesus Christ and following the path that Jesus has laid down for us. And then it says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body, so you are also complete through your union with Christ, who is ahead over every ruler and authority. Like I said, a life for Christ, with Christ is for everyone. It's available for the taking. It's about accepting the love that Jesus had for us and actually loving Jesus in return. And it's guarding and protecting that relationship that we have with Jesus. Do you love me? Through the spiritual disciplines, through worship and fellowship and Bible study and reading the Bible and prayer and so much more, we are not only able to only fall in love with Jesus, but we are able to stay in love with Jesus. It's so important. And if it has not happened to you yet, stay with it because it will come as it always does. This gift is available for the taking. Accept the love that Jesus has for you and love Jesus in return. Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding reception. He provided lunch for thousands. And even after his glorious resurrection, he was making breakfast for the disciples. But in the same warm, companionable way, Jesus is with us now. Do you love me? How do we respond? Jesus is asking, do you truly love me? And what is your response? Whether it is an honest no, or give me a little bit more time to think about it, or an unequivocal yes, Jesus wants to share his gift of nourishment and life with you and with me. And then we show Jesus that we love him by caring for others and for one another. And we share his gifts of nourishment and life with those around us. How full this life can be and is with the presence of Jesus that offers us constant acceptance and forgiveness and love like no other one does. May we live our lives for the one who died for us. After all, as Christians, we are called to be servants and givers of love, life, and hope. Jesus did this, and we should do the same. Let us pray. As Jesus called to Peter, not once but three times, do you love me? Jesus calls to each one of us, do you love me? Then he says, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. As we go forward, may we see the opportunities that are laid out before us to do just this, 
to show our love for Jesus, not only through our words, but most of all, through our actions and how we treat one another. And no matter where we are on this path called life, may we grow in our faith and in our love of Jesus. And Jesus, the most perfect relationship, this is the one we could ever ask or hope for. Do you love me? May we each respond, yes, Lord, I love you. Amen.